Men of Iron, Chapter 15 From the long, narrow, stone-paved armory court, and connected it with the inner buttery court, ran a narrow arch passageway, in which there was a picket gate, closed at night and locked from within. It was in this arch passageway that, according to little Robert Ingoldsby, the bachelors were lying in wait for Miles. Guskin's plan was that Miles should enter the court alone, the knights of the rose lying ambushed behind the angle of the armory, until the bachelors should show themselves. It was not without trepidation that Miles walked alone into the court, which happened then to be silent and quite empty. His heart beat more quickly than it was wont, and he gripped his cudgel behind his back, looking sharply this way and that, so as not to be taken unawares by a flanked movement of his enemies. Midway in the court, he stopped and hesitated for a moment. Then he turned as though to enter the armory. The next moment he saw the bachelors come pouring out from the archway. Instantly he turned and rushed back toward where his friends lay hidden, shouting, To the rescue! To the rescue! Stone him, roared Blunt. The villain escapes. He stooped and picked up a cobblestone as he spoke, flinging it after his escaping prey. It narrowly missed Miles' head. Had it struck him, there might have been no more of this story to tell. To the rescue! To the rescue! Miles' friends in answer, and the next moment he was surrounded by them. Then he turned, and swinging his cudgel, rushed back upon his foes. The bachelors stopped short at the unexpected sight of the lads with their cudgels. For a moment they rallied and drew their knives, then turned and fled toward the former place of hiding. One of them turned for a moment, and flung his knife at Miles with a quite deadly aim. But Miles, quick as a cat, ducked, and the weapon flew, clattering across the stony court. Then he who had flung it turned again to flee, but in his attempt he had delayed one instant too long. Miles reached him with a long arm stroke of his cudgel, just as he entered the passageway, knocking him over like a bottle, stunned and senseless. The next moment the picket gate was banged in their fences, and the bolts shot in the staples. The knights of the rose were left shouting and battering the palings with their cudgels. By this time the uproar of the fight had aroused those in the rooms, and officers fronting upon the armory court. Heads were thrust from many of the windows, with the eager interest that a fight always evokes. Beware, shouted Miles. Here they come again. He bore back toward the entrance of the alleyway as he spoke, and those behind him scattering to right and left, for the bachelors had rallied and were coming again to the attack, shouting. They were not a moment too soon in this retreat either, for the next instant the pickets flew open, and a volley of stones rained after the retreating knights of the rose. One smote Wilkes upon the head, knocking him down headlong, and another struck Miles upon his left shoulder, benumbing his arm from the fingertips to the fingerpin, so he thought that the limb might be broken. "'Get ye behind the buttress!' shouted those who looked down from the fight, from the windows. "'Get ye behind the buttresses!' and in answer the lads, scattering like a newly flushed covey of partridges, fled to and crouched in the sheltering angles of masonry to escape from the flying stones. And now followed a small lull in the battle. The bachelors feared to leave the protection of the archway, passageway, lest their retreat should be cut off, and the knights of the rose not daring to quit the shelter of the buttresses and angles of the wall that they should be knocked down by stone. The bachelor whom Miles had struck down with his cudgel was sitting up rubbing the back of his head, and Wilkes had gathered his wits enough to crawl to the shelter of the nearest buttress. Miles, peeping around the corner, behind which he stood, could see that the bachelors were gathered into a little group consulting together. Suddenly it broke asunder, and Blunt turned around. Ho, oh, Falworth, he cried, will ye hold truce while we parley with ye? Ay, answered Miles. Will ye give your honour that ye will hold your hands from harming us while we talk? Aye, said Miles, I pledge you my honour. I accept your pledge. See, here we throw aside our stones and lay down our knives. Lay ye be your clubs and meet us in parley at the horse block yonder. So be it, said Miles. And thereupon, standing his cudgel in the angle of the wall, he stepped boldly out into the open courtyard. Those of his party came scatteringly from right and left, gathered about him, and the bachelors advanced in a body, led by the head squire. "'Now what is it you would have, Walter Blunt?' said Miles, 
when both parties had met at the horse block. It is to say this to you, Miles Falworth. One time, not long since, ye did challenge me to meet you hand to hand in the dormitory. Then you did put a vile affront upon me for that which I have brought on this battle today. For I knew not then that ye were going to try your peasant tricks of wrestling. And so, without guarding myself, I met ye as ye did de desire. But ye had a knife, and would have stabbed him could you have done so, said Guscany. You lie, said Blunt. I had no knife. And then, without giving time to answer, ye cannot deny that I met you then at your bidding. Can ye, Falworth? Nay, said Miles, nor perhaps can ye deny it either. And at this covert reminding of his defeat, Miles' followers laughed scoffingly, and Blunt bit his lip. Ye have said it, said he. Then, since I met ye at your bidding, I dare ye to meet me at mine, and to fight this battle out between two selves, with sword and buckler and bassinet, as gentlemen should, and not in a wrestling match, like two county hogs. You are a cowardly wretch, Walter Blunt, burst out Wilkes, who stood by with a swelling lump on his head, already as big as a walnut. Well, ye know that Falworth is not match for you at broadsword. Is he not four years younger than you? And have ye not had three times the practice in arms that he has had? I see you're coward to seek to fight with cutting weapon. Blunt made no answer to Wilkes' speech, but gazed steadfastly at Miles, with a scornful smile curling the corner of his lip. Miles stood looking at the ground, without once lifting his eyes, not knowing what to answer, for he was well aware that he was no match for Blunt with the broad. "'Ye are afraid to fight me, Miles Falworth,' said Blunt tauntingly, and the bachelors gave a jeering laugh and echo. Miles then looked up, and I cannot say that his face was not a trifle whiter than usual. "'Nay,' said he, "'I am not afraid, and I will fight you, Blunt.' So be it, said Blunt, then let us go at it straightway in the armory yonder, for they be at dinner in the great hall, and just now there be no one by to stay us. Ye shall not fight him, Miles, burst out Guskin. He will murder you. You shall not fight him, I say. Miles turned away without answering him. What goes on? called one of those who were still looking out the window, as the crowd of boys passed beneath. Blunt and Falworth are going to fight it out, "'Hand to hand in the armory,' answered one of the bachelors, looking up. "'The brawling of the squires was adjusted to all, the adjoining part of the house, "'so the heads were withdrawn again, some laughing at the spiring of the cockles. "'But it was no jesting matter to poor Miles.'